This might be a grim autumnal day, but it's never a grim scene here at Lords. Welcome everybody to MCC's Cricket Annual for the first ever time it's coming to you in vision. What a golden year of cricket it's been for MCC. I guess highlighted by the test match against Australia here and England's resounding win. More than 120,000 came through the gate over those days. Indeed, there were 6,500 members queuing every morning for their seats in the pavilion. But it wasn't just about test match or international cricket, of course. At all levels of the game, cricket has featured here, and there was huge drama in the National Village Final, to name just one of the matches staged on this ground throughout the year. What a job it is MCC does, globally, of course, going all over the world. But specifically, I think we can focus on what happens during the English summer. Well over 400 out matches to go with the cricket that's played here, the MCC Young Cricketers, the MCC Young Women. The overall impact on the game, if you think about controlling the laws of the game, if you think about the World Cricket Committee, if you think about the meeting of minds and the meeting of friends, this really is a very special place, as much loved as perhaps it ever was and moving so well with the times, because this truly is a state-of-the-art cricket ground. Right, let's begin our review of a magical 2013 with a look at the major matches played here. After a winter which included a Test Series victory over India, Alistair Cook's first Test match on home soil as England captain came at Lords. The opponents, New Zealand, whose solitary victory in a Test at the home of cricket came in 1999. Tim Southey's wickets, however, put the Kiwis in control as they bowled Cook's team out for just 232 runs in the first innings. England were in trouble, but on the second day, under the floodlights, into the scene came James Anderson to take his 300th test wicket. <laughs> Former MCC young cricketer Ross Taylor scored fluently and troubled England's attack, but James Anderson went on to bag his fourth five-wicket haul at Lord's. In England's second innings, a 123-run partnership between Joe Root and Jonathan Trott put them firmly in the driving seat. Tim Southey then took his fifth wicket of the innings and his tenth of the match to give the visitors hope. New Zealand needed 239 to win, but Stuart Broad had other ideas, ripping through the black caps in record time with five wickets in just 5.4 overs. It was the quickest five-wicket haul at Lords since the First World War. MCC young cricketer Adam Dobb then dropped a catch, which inadvertently set up the winning wicket. James Anderson ran out Neil Wagner to complete England's 170-run victory. This is the honours board in the away dressing room. New Zealand would have felt flat, of course, at losing the test to England, but Tim Southey will have been mighty proud to see his name go up, 10 for 108. Just above him looked Dion Nash, lively bowler. Also a Kiwi, Malcolm Marshall, Andy Roberts. Some Australians have noted Bob Massey's performance here, one of the great swing bowling performances ever. New Zealand had finished the test match here then, but of course, Lords had more to offer them. It's 50 over cricket time. Spectators flooded into Lords to watch a resplendent England, all in red, take on New Zealand in the 50-over format. England, though, batted poorly and only posted 227 runs. James Anderson gave England hope by removing Luke Ronke and Kane Williamson in New Zealand's first over. Martin Guptill batted superbly, first taking the game away from England and then punishing them hitting what was to be the last ball to the boundary for the winning runs and his own century. Martin Guptill achieving every cricketer's dream, playing here at Lords for his country and going on to make 100, and what a way to get there. 
as well. The real heartbeat of the Lord's Summer, though, is the two test matches. New Zealand had played the first of them, and in mid-July, the ground was sold out for the battle for the Ashes, for this, for this tiny urn that's caused so much fascination for so long. England and Australia here on Hallowed Turf. The Queen was in attendance. As a sellout crowd settled down for the most famous of fixtures, England against Australia at Lords. And for the first time in over 50 years, cameras were allowed in the long room to capture the players on their way to the outfield. But England looked in serious trouble as they crumbled to 28 for three. <laughs> then Ian Bell arrived at the crease. His superb century was his third in consecutive Ashes tests. On the second day, Ryan Harris secured his own place on the Lord's Honours Board with a fantastic bowling performance. But the bizarre and the sublime brought Swan his own five-wicket haul, as Australia collapsed to 128 all out in reply to England's 361. All this saw Joe Root back at the crease and in wonderful form to score his first century as opener for England. A star was surely born this third day at Lord's. Joe Root must be on an England team sheet forever and a day. Perhaps he'll follow in the line of great Yorkshire opening batsmen, Sir Leonard Hutton, Geoffrey Boycott and Michael Vaughan, to name but three. That was his brother, incidentally, his younger brother, Billy Root, coming out to congratulate him. And Billy is on the MCC ground staff here at Lord's. Now, should you be unlucky and get rain when you come to watch cricket here, or should the cricket itself lack a bit of spice, you can come to the museum. I'm browsing through some fabulous old books this is a book of cartoons, and W.G. Grace is here, perhaps the most famous of all names to have played on this great ground. Amongst those that have toured, how about Glenn McGrath? His figures of 8 for 38 in 1997 are the best by any overseas bowler. It's a magnificent oil-on-canvas portrait by Justin Mortimer. There's something almost sinister about Glenn in that uh, painting, though there was nothing sinister about him on the fourth morning of the match when MCC had a rather charming task for him. England declared on day four after Root lost his wicket with Australia facing a notional 583 to win. They resisted England's bowling until the last over of the last session, when Swan finally trapped Pattinson, LBW, to wrap up the game with a day to spare. ECB awarded MCC with a very good pitch mark for the Ashes Test match. This is the highest category attainable and further evidence of the good work of Mick Hunt and his team. Imagine just for a moment, if you will, walking into this dressing room for the first time. You could be a cricketer of any standard. The Village Cup final is played here. The universities still play here. Eton and Harrow still play here. Counties play here on Cup Finals Day. Middlesex play here. MCC play here. And of course, international cricketers play here. One of the reasons for the atmosphere, the mystique of the room, I think, is, is the honours boards. Um, five wicket and ten wicket halls here. Graham Swan, five for 44, as you've just seen. The first spinner to record a five wicket haul against Australia since Hedley Verity in 1934. He could bowl a bit, they say. Here are the batsmen. Ian Bell with his three consecutive hundreds. Only four players have ever done that. This is the one against the Australians at the other day, 109. And then Joe Root with that 180 in the same match. I wonder what those ghosts of the game think of a fellow that gets out playing the reverse lap and is caught at third man. <laughs> These dressing rooms inspire test match cricketers, but as I mentioned earlier, they inspire cricketers of all talents, not least the county players who slog around the circuit all summer, but then get to play here on a big cup final day. It was the YB40 this year, Glamorgan and Nottinghamshire, and of course the Nottinghamshire side features two of the guys on that board, Stuart Broad and uh, Graham Swan. This year saw the 50th anniversary of the first limited overs final to be played at Lords. Michael Lum and Alex Hales got Knott's Outlaws off to a good start. 
Simon Jones checked their progress when he took two wickets in his last match for the Morgan. Before Notts captain Chris Reid carried his side to a total of 244 runs. Three wickets each for Ajmal Shahzad and Samit Patel meant that Glamorgan never really threatened Nottinghamshire's total. Stuart Broad then finished the job off, taking three wickets in the final over to secure a first cup final win for Notts at the home of cricket since 1989. A wide range of fixtures were played at Lords during 2013. MCC competed in seven of them, with the first being a 133-run victory over Wales. In the resumption of Lords' oldest rivalry, Eton beat Harrow by five wickets, and hot on the heels of the Ashes Test, MCC piled more misery on the Australians by recording their own five-wicket victory over Melbourne Cricket Club. It wasn't all doom and gloom for Australia at Lords, though. Meg Lanning sparkled with the bat to inspire her side to a 27-run victory over England women in the revamped Women's Ashes series. In the National Village Cup final, there was high drama as Cleta CC from Cumbria reduced to 64 for 5, chasing 192, posted by Gloucestershire's Rockhampton CC, turned the game around to register an unlikely one-wicket victory. In the inter-services T20, the Army proved the dominant force, with Captain Storm Green marshalling his team to success over the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy sides. On the nursery ground, MCC men's and women's teams played Japan to celebrate 150 years of Japanese cricket. Over 1,000 spectators attended to see the club win both games. Well, the man behind all of that cricket is with me now, a former colleague at Hampshire, previously of Essex and England, of course, John Stevenson, who's the man in charge of, of cricket and estates. What a grand job title. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot to do. I bet it is. And this cricket fixture list, particularly on this ground, uh, puts a lot of pressure on, on the club and on Mick Hunt, the groundsman, but the standard of pitches and, and of the ground itself remains ever high. Yeah, absolutely. Every year I have to go through the fixture list with a fine tooth comb with Mick because to put all these matches on, plus Middlesex matches, Test matches, ODIs, takes a lot of planning. And this wide brief, I mean, are they all still fulfilling the initial ambition? If you picked, say, Oxford and Cambridge and, and Eton and Harrow, there's no danger of them being an anachronism? No, not at all. I mean, they're the two oldest fixtures uh, ever staged here. Um, but they are of massive significance to the club, Eton mm -hmm. versus Harrow. Uh, we get a big crowd here. Uh, most of the boxes are sold out. And uh, it's a great historic and social day. MCC used the nursery ground itself, but of course other people use it as well. All the international sides train there. Um, there's a lot of corporate hospitality there. It's a kind of minor fascination in itself, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's become so important it's tr strategically to the club as well in terms of providing fantastic practice facilities for international teams who come in three days before a test match now. Every day you'll find something going on on the nursery ground. We're trying to reinvigorate the cross arrows. We give them 14 days a year on the nursery ground, but we're really determined to keep the cross arrows going. It's part of the tradition, part of the DNA of the club, and it's something that everyone loves doing later in the season. And John, you have a formidable fixture list of outmatches. We do, and it's a good mixture of schools cricket and club cricket. At the moment, we play a lot more public schools than we do state schools, but that's something we're looking to address in the future. And MCC is still responsible for the laws of the game. We are, and it's a role that we take extremely seriously. Uh, but we're trying to make the laws more accessible to the general public and to children. And we've just put a, a new laws animation video on our website and on YouTube, which is fronted up by Stephen Fry. And it's a really fantastic thing to watch. Any questions? Just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. Middlesex played a total of 15 matches at Lords in 2013. After a nine-wicket victory over Derbyshire in the county championship and a high-scoring draw against Surrey in which Chris Rogers hit a double hundred, Middlesex's form dipped. And despite winning four fixtures in a row in August, their overall record at HQ ended up as 1-7, drew three, lost five. 
the shortest format of the game in particular showed sustained appeal throughout the season, with fans being turned away from the ground for a T20 clash with Surrey. If you trawl this great pavilion through a day, you'll come across all sorts of treasures. I don't mean artists and <laughs> paintings, I mean cricketers. Angus Fraser now plays an enormous role with Middlesex, head coach or director of cricket. Managing director, I think it's my official title, but dog's body. <laughs> dog's Does body. Better. And Middlesex had a very good season. Not bad, yeah. It offered a little bit more than we got in the end. We should have finished a bit stronger, but if you'd have asked me at the start of the season, would we have settled for it? Yeah, I think, I think we would have, actually. Do you know much about the history of the relationship between Middlesex and MCC? Yeah, I, I suppose as a player, you didn't pay much attention to it because you just got out there and, and, and bowled and tried to win games. But I suppose in my current position now, where you're... I suppose to move the club forward trying to draw on the history of that and, and make it something that the players are very aware of and proud of, uh, proud to be associated with, it, it's something that you've read a lot more into, yeah. And I imagine Middlesex supporters had mixed feelings when Chris Rogers was defying the England attack last summer. When he was selected there was certainly a number of emails saying, have we prepared for this, are we ready for it? I think everybody at the club was chuffed to bits for Chris Rogers and if I look back at the Ashes, being slightly unpatriotic, I'd say that him scoring his 100 at Chesley Street was a highlight for myself. One or two other standouts from your summer? Toby Rowland Jones uh, got a hat-trick here, uh, which is a, a wonderful feat for a fast bowler against Derbyshire. And I say it's always nice to have the likes of Stephen Finn uh, knocking around. We're very proud that, as a club, we do continue to produce England cricketers. That's the present. Let's turn our attention to the past, because I don't suppose any two men have had more impact on the club than those two. Um, Gabby Allen, and Plum Warner, both Middlesex cricketers and MCC presidents. Uh, and now, Mike Gatting, your former captain, is, is crossing the great divide from Middlesex captain to president of MCC. It is, uh, and as you can imagine with Gat, it's something that he's, he's not told, holding back on, is he? He's throwing himself at it and uh, seems to be getting involved with everything that's going on. And no, I'm sure it'll be a memorable year for, for him and the club. No club has a travelling portfolio quite like the one that belongs to the MCC. England used to tour under the banner of MCC and this was the blazer that they travelled in. Though that's no longer the case, MCC take tours all over the world, spreading the gospel of the great game. In the last year alone, they've been to Argentina, the Cayman Islands, France, Cyprus and Uganda, playing at all levels, educating and enlightening new people and old. MCC's first stop was to South America to celebrate the centenary of Argentinian cricket. The club won five games with one abandoned. A tour of the Cayman Islands followed. MCC played six and won four, also taking part in two youth training sessions. In France, MCC played six, winning four, despite being hampered by injury and having to call out for bowling reinforcements from home. Matthew Root, father of England's Joe Root, led a successful tour to Cyprus, where MCC won every game. MCC are frequent visitors to Africa, and in October the club departed on their third tour of Uganda in the last 10 years. Arfan Akram captained his team through 13 days of challenging cricket, which included games against sides from Uganda and Rwanda, and took them to the Kiambogo Cricket Oval, where funding for a grass wicket had been granted during MCC's 2005 tour. Akram's men won four, drew one and lost two. The players also toured local schools, giving children training sessions and the benefit of their cricketing expertise. Leeds Bradford dominated the landscape of university cricket in 2013, remaining unbeaten in the two-day MCCU Championship and winning two out of the three other trophies available to them. In the games against the counties, the Yorkshire-based students continue to shine, recording their inaugural first-class victory over Leicestershire. Clive Radley's MCCU Combined 11 gives a further opportunity to the best non-contracted players from the MCCU system to play in the second 11 championship, where his team secured five good draws this season. 
There are many strands to MCC, some less appreciated than others. It's within the last 10 years that MCC has taken over university cricket. Clive Radley, who used to run the Young Cricketers, played here, of course, for Middlesex for so many years, now runs the university cricket. Clive, good to see you in this room you know well. Yes, thank you very much. I've been here more times than most, I think. I think you have. Um, just tell us how MCC uh, run the universities, how the, how the construction of university cricket sits now. Well, the MCC sponsor to um, six universities, that's Cambridge, Oxford, Loughborough, Durham, Cardiff and Leeds Bradford. And they put in a, a considerable amount of money to make sure that the, the, all of the students get a good cricketing education alongside their, uh, also, whilst they're getting a degree. Has this incorporation of universities improved the standard of play? It certainly has. I'm a small cog in the wheel and as much as I pick a combined side from the six universities, I liaise with all the coaches at the uh, various universities to pick a combined side. I know that they'll be well drilled, they know exactly what the game is all about, they know where to bowl the ball and, 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 and they talk a, a, a professional game of cricket. So much so that is there a decent flow through now from universities to first class counties? I believe I'm writing saying that uh, between 20% and 25% of English qualified players playing county cricket at the moment have come through the system, so that just shows you that it, that it is working. Great stories coming out of Leeds Bradford this last summer. Yes, it started very tragically about this time last year when uh, one of their uh, star players and the guy who was going to captain them last year tragically died, a guy called Tommy Hardman, who was going to captain the combined side. Lovely chap good wholehearted cricketer. But the boys kind of recovered themselves and went on to have a very good summer almost in his memory. Absolutely, whether it was inspired by it or, or whatever, but the Leeds Bradford side came out on top in almost all of the competitions that the unis play and they produced a lot of very good cricketers. One lad called Tom Craddock who came away from Leeds Bradford the year before but went to Essex and was proving to be a very fine leg spin bowler and of course he got five wickets against the England side at Chelmsford last year. So he'll remember those wickets, I'm sure, forever. Cardiff MCCU graduate Heather Knight also had a summer to remember, hitting a match-saving 157 runs against Australia women in the Women's Ashes Test at Wormsley in August. Alongside a MCC University's combined squad, MCC Young Cricketers began their season with a world-class training camp in the UAE in March. Throughout the season, the YCs played 36 games and secured 11 victories, managing to get five players signed up by the counties in the process. Not all the talented youngsters want to further their education at university. Some want to get straight into the game of cricket. And that's where the famed young pros here at Lords can play their part. The boss these days is Mark Elaine. I first knew about the young pros in the days when Don Wilson was in charge and then Clive Radley took over. And now it's at Mark, former Gloucestershire captain. What do you look for when a, a young cricketer comes to audition with you? Well, uh, the boys that I'm looking for and girls, uh, the kind of cricketer that I feel will fit in nicely in the environment that we've got here because it's about creating a culture for everyone to learn and develop their game. You have this extraordinary atmosphere and, and you seem to develop a togetherness and quickly you create a team. That can't be easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's, it's such a, a great thing for the, for the young players because these players would normally be running around the country trying to trial for a county two to three weeks at a time struggling to really embed themselves into that particular county's culture. At least here, we have them for six months, sometimes two years, three years, and they can really relax and enjoy their cricket and express themselves in the right way. And the boys get to play out here? Yeah, they get to play here one game a year, one day, normally in mid-May. It's a game they all look forward to. We play against MCC, of course, and uh, this year, for the first time, I played against the young cricketers. I was glad to say that they gave us a, a bit of a thumping, which I was pleased about, but not so pleased about my LBW decision. <laughs> <laughs> We've lived with a few of those yeah. in our life. Um, and members, I think, will be interested in the sort of season you've had. We play some really fantastic cricket. As a consequence, we, we managed to get five players uh, with full county contracts, so, um, so I'm really pleased with that. MCC and Lords have a massive impact globally. Um, part of the, the attraction 
of uh, taking on this role um, was just because of that. Um, I love cricket, I love the development of cricket, I love being involved in cricket and no one does it better than MCC and uh, to try and inspire some, some young kids that want to play first class cricket here to me is, is a relatively easy task uh, but one that's very enjoyable. For the members to keep an eye out in the next year or two, a batsman, a bowler and a wicketkeeper, say three names. <laughs> three names, okay. I'm a big fan of young Stuart Pointer who is, as a wicketkeeper, as pure as you, you would see. The ball melts into his gloves. He's worked on his batting um, whilst he's been here and has scored some scrumptious centuries. Other batters, young Chris Paisley, left-hander, top of the order. Not your typical standout, um, doesn't catch the eye, but to the connoisseur you'll sit and you'll think, oh, I really like what he's doing. He works his way through innings, he grinds it out, and he's got a game that can take him on as well. Young Harry Podmore, who's going to be with Middlesex this year, I think he's very kind of untapped. He, he bowled a bit for us this year and we loved what we see. He's playing for Middlesex now, full contract with Middlesex. I think he'll play first class cricket next year. Great. What a nursery for the game you provide. As you can see, the MCC in its many guises, more good work, and I think the young boys and girls here are in very safe hands. Thanks, Mark Alain. The end of 2013 saw MCC reaffirm its partnership with the Lord's Taverners City Cup, where Janak Vallon from Leicestershire earned the chance to play for the YCs in the next season. Women are having an increasing and impressive impact on the game and vice versa, of course. So much so that one of England's greatest players, Claire Taylor, is being immortalised here by the artist Emma Wesley. Her painting will hang in this pavilion. So, as the impact of women on the game increases, so it's important that young female cricketers are looked after. MCC started to do so more than 10 years ago with their own YC programme for young females and that's increased substantially so much so that all over the country we find women playing the game in fact chance to shine bringing cricket back into state schools has more than two million kids playing the game and more than 40 percent of those are girls better still ecb who operate just over there the other side of the ground from this main pavilion are getting very involved with women as well the england women's side is hugely successful it recently won the Ashes, of course, during this past summer. And the head of women's cricket is Claire Connor. This is the second summer um, that the MCC and ECB have collaboratively um, rolled out the, um, the Young Cricketers programme. We saw a real joint approach to make sure that the players on the programme and the coaching that they were receiving, the strength and conditioning work they were doing, it was all completely aligned to our central player development programme. The fixtures that the players have played under that MCC Young Cricketers banner have really added to their overall fixtures programme. Given that there are lots of under-19s and academy and some England players in the Young Cricketers, it's really important that that fixtures programme really complements what we're trying to do. At the start of this year, we looked at our England Women's Development programme under-19 squad, looked at which players there could really benefit from some international opportunity, talked to MCC closely and looked at how we might enter an inaugural girls under 19 competition out in the UAE. So that's the first time that MCC have funded a girls under 19 programme or an under 19 tour. MCC has a significant art collection, both antique and contemporary. Much of it is displayed in the pavilion itself. I'm now in the Long Room Bar and I've focused on a painting that's a particular favourite of mine. There are three in this bar by Andrew Festing, featuring players of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. And I've gone back to the one that, well, actually starts in the 1930s with Sir Leonard Hutton in the cap there. But look at the names, Godfrey Evans, Peter May, Brian Statham, Dennis Compton. Fred Truman, Tom Graveney, Alec Bedser, Ken Barrington, fantastic. The likeness is amazing and the atmosphere of the person is caught so well by festing. But look perhaps most importantly for our purposes here to Ted Dexter and to Colin Cowdery and think what they gave to the game through their Spirit of Cricket initiative adopted by so many people around the world. The MCC's initiative features the Cowdery Lecture named after Colin 
uh, and many other things too. There's a partnership with Chance to Shine that's bringing cricket back into state schools. And new this year are the Christopher Martin Jenkins Spirit of Cricket Awards, recognising CMJ, that fine broadcaster and journalist. So uh, a big plus for Messrs Dexter and Cowdery, both who served on committees and went on to become presidents of the club in beginning the MCC Spirit of Cricket initiative. 2013 was the club's fifth consecutive year working in partnership with the Cricket Foundation and their Chance to Shine initiative. In April, Somerset's Craig Keysvetter delivered a flagship MCC Spirit of Cricket assembly in which he presented Wemden St George's with one of 1,500 replica Ashes urns distributed to Chance to Shine schools. In total, over 240,000 school pupils took part in an MCC Spirit of Cricket school assembly during the year. Children from Stephen Finn's old primary school were given the opportunity to play at Lords during a lunchtime in the New Zealand Test. The 13th annual MCC Spirit of Cricket Cowdery Lecture was delivered by Simon Taufel and was followed by a panel discussion involving Owen Morgan and Mike Gatting. MCC and the BBC announced the creation of the Christopher Martin Jenkins Spirit of Cricket Awards. Alton CC Under 13 Girls won the Youth Award and Wayne Madsen won the Elite Prize. City Academy Bristol was the school beneficiary. In a new development of the partnership with the Cricket Foundation, Lords threw its doors wide open on Tuesday the 25th of June, as 600 children descended onto the famous ground for the first MCC Spirit of Cricket Open Day. The kids from Chance to Shine schools all around the country, together with local Westminster schools, had their run of the place, enjoying a range of cricketing and educational activities. For all the runs scored, the wickets taken and the catches held, my favourite memory of the summer, I think, is the MCC Spirit of Cricket Day, when children from all over the country had a chance to see this fabulous cricket ground for themselves. 199 years of cricket here. Yep, Thomas Lord came in 1814, so next year is the club's bicentenary. And after all, it's just been granted a royal charter, so it is a very special period in the club's History. It might be raining now, but come the spring, the sweet summer sun will be upon us again. For the moment, from all of us at Lords, goodbye.